All right, this video, this portion of the video is going to take us through the uh, classification of matter due to properties. All right, so last time we classified matter. All right, so you're going to open up this document. It looks like this, and we're just going to put some information into these boxes. All right, so we have properties matter. The top half is going to focus on the physical properties. The bottom half is going to focus on chemical properties. All right, and we're going to use this information a little bit later on to separate uh, to use this information to separate fixtures. It's kind of out of order. I didn't really do a good job of organizing this. These two are going to be on there, but they're going to be in a different spot. So make sure you're paying attention to the to the title where what it says. All right. All right. All right, so physical properties. All right, so this is going to just go into the, the properties of matter. Uh, property of matter not involving a chemical change. All right, so a physical property is something where it talks about it's not involving any any kind of a chemical change to happen, um, which I'll get into in a second. Uh, a lot of it can be like an extension of your sense. Like a physical property is the color of something. Um, when you change the state of matter of something, all right, and this is kind of kind of go hand in hand with the uh, um, behaviors, et cetera. It, oh. Oh, sorry. Uh, hardness, how hard something is, you know, like a diamond can is the hardest on there's a scale. We're not going to get into the <clears throat> most scale of hardness in diamond. Nothing can cut a diamond or very few things can cut a diamond. Uh, so how hard something is. All right. It's a scratch test. That is, is what it's done. Malleability, uh, how much you can bend and shape something like gold is very valuable. One of the reasons why gold is so valuable is because it's highly malleable. All right. It's highly malleable, which you can hammer it without it shattering. You can shape it into very, very thin pieces of jewelry uh, for people to wear. So it has some value there. Density, how compact the particles are. All right, so this is how, you know, if it's a liquid or anything like that, you can describe how much it flows, conductivity, how much it conducts heat or electricity. These are all examples of physical properties. All right, so these are all examples of physical properties describing the properties of matter. So you can classify matter based on their physical properties. All right, and we'll talk about that a little bit with like the periodic table, how that gets classified with physical, but also chemical properties as well. So we'll talk about this uh, a little bit more in the next unit, how the periodic table is organized based on physical and chemical properties. All right, physical changes. Uh, anytime you're doing a physical change, you're, you're you're not changing the substance, all right? So that's the, really the key there. Properties are changed, but the substance remains the same. So you might change it the way it looks, but you're not changing the substance. You might change it from, if I melt an ice cube, well, now it, it went from an ice cube to, it went from a solid to a liquid, but it's still water, all right? It doesn't turn into something else. All right, so a physical change, it just changes from one thing to another. All right, so when it says provide an example of physical change, any of it, you freeze, and, you freeze water, it turns into ice. You boil water, it turns into water vapor. It doesn't magically disappear. It just turns into wa water vapor, And because guess what? If it got cold, it would turn back into water, that water vapor would. You can change the size of something, you know, like cutting a piece of paper. Um, any of those things are examples of, of physical changes, right? Because I'm not changing the substance. Another one I should have put on there is dissolving something. Because dissolving is a lot of times people think of that as a physical change. When you dissolve one thing into another, uh, so write that down, dissolving, uh, if I mix, um, salt and water or, or say I'm making hot chocolate. I mix hot chocolate together. I'm dissolving the hot the hot cocoa into the into the milk or water. It's milk because if you use water, you're you're crazy. Um, but it would be uh, that would be dissolving. I'm not changing the substance. I'm just dissolving it in there. Right, so an example of a physical change would be dissolving as well. Like I said, I gotta add that. Uh, and you can use physical properties to help separate. And this is what like I said. This is what we're going to do in this class. We're going to have a, a lab where we have to separate a mixture. All right. And so there's a couple ways that you can do it. All right. You can separate by using the, the physical properties to separate something. So if you have a solid and a liquid that are mixed together, uh, it, you can use a process known as filtration. 
All right, this method is used to separate solids and liquids. So you can use the properties, all right, what state of matter they're in, to help separate the liquid. All right, so an example I gave there is a coffee, uh, a coffee filter. Uh, what that does is that keeps all the solid, as you use that filter paper, that keeps the solid coffee grounds from going into your, into your cup of coffee. And then it allows the liquid to go through it, all right, giving it the, obviously, the taste like coffee. Right. <clears throat> um, using properties to separate also is particle size. All right, you can use the size. A lot of times this is used in cooking. Uh, you can weed out the, uh, the thicker parts. Like this is like a little strainer to, to keep the, to let the water through. If you've ever made noodles, you know this. Uh, you use a strainer, a uh, sifter, you know, depending on what you're making. But you can use a strainer to drain the liquid from solid particles. Or you can remove if you've, you know, if you're cooking like a chicken soup or some chicken noodle soup to get the bone out or something. You can use a strainer to kind of get the larger pieces to get those out of there. All right, so you can separate based on particle size. I put this in there because every kid has played with one of these. When they're younger, ours is, I mean, this first one's red. It always seems to be yellow, but it's just a little sifter. You know, you like scoop up all the sand. You're like, it's fun. All the sand goes through, but the pebbles and the rock and whatever else is in there. Sometimes you catch a bug, stays there. All right, so you can separate based on particle size. You can take um, larger objects and separate them from smaller ones. Just the smaller ones have to be able to fit through those holes. All right, using physical change to separate. All right, so you can also use physical changes to separate a, a mixture. Like I said, we're going to be doing this in class. All right, one good way is evaporation. All right, evaporation is used to separate a solution. All right, and a solution, we haven't talked about this yet, but a solution is something that is so evenly mixed that you can't even see the particles with it with a microscope because it's so evenly pulled into the to the solution if i if i stir salt into water it all looks like one substance it's a homogeneous mixture uh, but it's so evenly mixed that it, it's really difficult to find the salt salt particles you can taste it but it's really hard to see well evaporation what evaporation will do here you have a bowl that's being evaporated uh, water it all looks like just water but as the evaporation process goes on whoops as the evaporation process goes on, you can see it, the water starts to leave. And some of the, I think this was an example of like copper sulfate, whatever. Whatever's in the solution, as it's starting to, as the water is starting to evaporate, the, the parts of the solution will settle on the bottom and on the sides. Sometimes it'll go on the sides. And, and we'll see this when we do our separating mixture as well. And eventually, as all the water leaves, what's left behind is what was mixed in. You you didn't even you may not have even known that it was there, because once you evaporate, it'll all look like one liquid. But as it evaporated, you could see the solid particles that were left. You can also use that to separate two liquids as well. Like if you have like a, a cooking oil and water mixed together, and you wanted to separate the two, you could boil away the water, and you'd be left with because as long as they have different boiling points, um, the water will boil away, whereas the the cooking oil wouldn't. Uh, here's an example, too, of distillation. It's just like evaporation, but it, it cools, and then it will go down this little, little cooling tube, uh, this condenser, and it will come back as water. So you heat up the water here. You got a lot going on on the screen. Get out of here. I don't like this. Yeah, got it. All right, as it heats up the water, as it heats up the water, and then it goes down into... The, the cup, the water will go up, it will rise up as you apply heat, it will then cool and go down into this cooling, uh, cooling the water out, it's cooling down, and then it will drip into a separate area. All right, this is distillation. So eventually what you'll be left with is salt left in this uh, and water left in this. So it's a good way to purify water. You know, like sometimes if, if somebody, if, you know, they talk about... Uh, if you ever have a situation where you're not sure if the water's safe to drink, uh, that's a that's a good way to do it is to evaporate it. You set up this little contraption here to distill the water. All right, and then there's also chemical properties. All right, chemical properties are the ability to produce a change in in composition. A new substance is being formed. Um, so these are properties that have the ability to to 
change the composition of something, change what's what something's made up of. All right, and so reactivity, how things react, when things chemically react together, a new substance is formed. So how reactive something is. Flammability, uh, the ability to catch fire, toxicity. All right, uh, that when something is poisoned, it changes the, the makeup of it. Oxidation, rust being formed. All right, when oxygen reacts with iron, it forms rust. All right. Chemical changes, examples of that would be like things like uh, you have a new substance is being created. All right, so it's it's uh, a car is rusting. Uh, that's an example of a chemical change. You have it's, it was once iron, now it's iron oxide. All right, because the, the oxygen has reacted with the iron, you can't undo it by physical means. All right, food spoiling, you can't unspoil food. Once it starts to spoil, you can't pop it in the fridge and be like, it, it'll make itself right. It won't. All right. You can't undo that process because it's a chemical change is occurring. Campfire. I can't put this fire into the uh, into the fridge and have it come back out of log. All right. It has the ashes. I can't take the ashes and be like, all right, let's just let's freeze these and it should be OK. No, it's it's a, it's a new substance is being formed. Anytime you cook something, that's why it's, you know, sometimes it's not healthy to to eat like raw meat. But you can once you cook it, it, it alters it. You might say, well, that meat is still meat. It doesn't like alter it too much. Yeah, but it alters it enough. It changes the makeup of it enough to where it becomes healthy to eat, to consume. All right, so anytime you're cooking things, those are examples of chemical changes occurring. Identifying a chemical change. So how do you know if the change is chemical or physical? Now, this isn't always the case, but it says a color change can indicate a new substance is formed. All right, so like food spoiling. So if your food looks like this, don't eat it. That food is going bad. All right? A color change can be a good indication. Same thing with rust here. I put a rusty car door there. Those are good examples of, of chemical changes. Now, it can be like if, if I put food coloring in water, I'm not like, boom, chemical change. No, it's still water. You just mix in food coloring. All right, so it's not always the case, but color change can be a good indication. Gas production, bubbles forming, that's a good indication that – you know, there was no bubbles and then all of a sudden a bunch of bubbles start to rise up. That means gas is being produced. And so that bubble, that formation of bubbles is a good indication that a chemical change has taken place. All right.